our star for the evening, Ryan Rubenzahl from Caltech, who's going to be talking um, tonight about measuring the speed of stars more precisely than your car's speedometer. And um, we actually have a group in our organization that does exoplanet uh, confirmations for NASA's test program, although we use the um, transit method um, because it's much easier, of course, than the spectroscopic methods that uh, you have. So Ryan, take it away. All right. Uh, well, so thanks, Steve, for inviting me here and to all of you for having me to speak. So um, just to introduce myself again, my name is Ryan Rubenzahl. I'm a graduate student at Caltech, uh, working on my PhD in the field of exoplanet astronomy. Um, and the method that I use to find exoplanets is this one that I'll describe in this talk to measure the, the masses and orbits of exoplanets by actually measuring the speeds of their stars and then using our knowledge of how orbits and gravity work to infer the presence of planets and derive their, uh, their properties. So just to sort of start with, uh, with the basics, um, just sort of discussing what an exoplanet is. Um, I'm sure we're all very familiar with what planets are in our solar system, uh, especially the one that we live on. Uh, our solar system has eight planets, sorry to Pluto. Uh, here, they're all shown with their sizes to their relative scales, although the distances between these planets is very not to scale. And altogether, these eight planets, plus any asteroids, comets, dwarf planets, dust in the solar system, that, that makes up what we call the solar system. An exoplanet is just a planet that orbits some other star, not the sun. Uh, this is a shorthand way of saying extrasolar planet or outside the solar system planet. And together with its star, an exoplanet, and maybe any other exoplanets or exomoons and exocomets would make up an extrasolar system. So this here is an artist's conception of stars in the night sky, many of which you can see orbited by exoplanets. Uh, in some cases, multiple planets with their orbits drawn. And they have all sorts of random orientations in space. So how do we actually detect these? Uh, how do we even know that these are real things in space? Well, there's a number of ways, most of which are indirect. Um, there is a direct way to actually take pictures of exoplanets, which is very difficult. Uh, I'm not going to get into that in this talk. Feel free to ask afterwards, although I noticed in the um, mention of uh, your YouTube channel, that you, in a previous meeting, you had uh, Jason Wang on here to describe how that method works in, in more detail. Uh, so I guess check out that video on your YouTube channel to hear more about that. But what I mean by indirect is that we're observing the star, the light coming from the star, and then we look for changes in that, and that allows us to infer that a planet is affecting its star. So one way to do that is with the transit method, which was just mentioned a little earlier. And in this case, if we're, we're observing the overall brightness of the star, and if it happens to have planets, and if we happen to be observing this system edge on to those orbits, then each time the planet orbits around, it will pass in front of its star and block a little bit of that light, depending on how big the planet is relative to its star. This is called a transit. And if that planet is bigger, it will block more light and you'll see a larger dip. And if it's smaller, you'll see a smaller dip. So this lets us infer the size of a planet relative to its star, as well as its orbital period. That is how long it takes the planet to go around its star once. For the Earth, that's how we define what one year is. And that period is simply the amount of time between successive dips. And if there are multiple planets, you can distinguish different planets from transit de uh, dips of different sizes. And also you would see these repeating regularly, uh, maybe for the, the large planet every year, for a smaller planet, maybe it's as fast as every few days. Um, and these can also transit at the same time. In some cases, you can see that gives this kind of funky shape to the uh, transit dip. Another way to indirectly measure a planet, and this is the one I'll spend most of this talk discussing, is the Doppler method. This uses the Doppler effect. Uh, and I guarantee you've experienced the Doppler effect in the context of sound at some point. Uh, so just to sort of describe a little bit of the physics of how this works, 
say we have this dot that's a sound source that's emitting sound waves, and we have a person off to the side of it. As that source is moving towards the person, the, you can see the waves start getting bunched up on that side approaching. Uh, and those waves getting bunched up means that the wavelength, the distance between peaks in the waves is getting smaller. And for sound, that means the pitch will be higher. And that's true right up until it passes you. And then as the source is receding, you're hearing waves that are further apart. Because each time a wave is emitted, the source moves a little bit. And now that distance between wave peaks or that wavelength is getting longer. And for sound, that means the pitch gets lower. So that gives you that familiar sound of a car sort of whizzing past and going nee -yum. So light also does this. It behaves like a wave. But for light, changing the wavelength corresponds to changing the color of the light. For sound, it's the pitch. For light, it's the color. So in the visible part of light, blue is the shortest wavelength, and red is the longest. So if something is approaching us, we say that it is blue shifted because it will appear to look bluer than if it were stationary. And if something is receding from us, we say it looks red shifted because it appears redder than if it were stationary. And uh, a useful way to, to think about this that my high school physics teacher taught us uh, that has stuck with me to this day is to imagine a baboon walking towards you and you see its blue face. And if it's walking away, well, so, Perhaps some of you are mischievously thinking, well, if green is bluer than red, how fast would I have to go to make the red light in front of me look green? Well, you can work out the math for this, and it turns out uh, it's quite fast, uh, over 100 million miles an hour, or 18% the speed of light. So this likely is not a valid excuse for uh, explaining your way out of running a red light. So how do we actually use this method to find planets? That's the, the whole goal. So as the planet is orbiting its star, this, it's orbiting because the star is pulling on it gravitationally. And the planet is doing the same thing back to the star, although much less because the planet is much less massive than its star. But it still is causing its star to move in its own little orbit, uh, scaled down um, proportionally to how much smaller that planet's mass actually is. And that causes the star to move around in its orbit. And at some points, from our perspective, it will look like it's moving towards us. And at other points in its orbit, it will look like it's moving away from us. So if we take the light from a star and split it up into all its colors, for example, by using a prism, and uh, we get this rainbow of colors called a spectrum, you can see that there's many of these dark bands throughout there where sort of some of these colors seem to be missing. This is from different elements and molecules in the atmosphere of a star that absorb light at very specific colors. So we can use these lines, these are called absorption lines, very creatively named, as a sort of reference. And as they move back and forth, we can track the motion of the star towards and away from us as those lines get red shifted and blue shifted. And this will go back and forth once for every orbit of the planet. And that the amount that it moves by depends on how heavy the planet is. So a bigger planet will make the star move faster, which makes these lines shift back and forth by a much larger amount. That, that shift we call the Doppler shift. And so while the transit tells us how big a planet is, this method, the Doppler method, tells us its mass, how heavy it is. So these two methods are complementary in that together they can tell us about the density of a planet, whether it's more uh, likely to be rocky like the Earth, or perhaps more gaseous like Neptune or uh, a gas giant like Jupiter. So these two techniques especially have been prolific in finding exoplanets all over the galaxy. This animation uh, shows the, and it, the discoveries of these planets over time. Um, but before I wanna, I started, I wanna just point out sort of what we're actually looking at here. So on the vertical axis, we have the mass of a planet um, in Earth units, so one Earth mass is where the Earth is, and it's at a one-year orbital period. We have some of the solar system planets here for reference, so Mercury is the closest and the smallest. Jupiter is way up here at something like 11 years and uh, 300 Earth masses. And the very first exoplanet that was discovered was uh, this one called 51 Peg B. This is an approximately Jupiter-sized planet but it's super close to its star. 
it orbits its star once every few days. Uh, so it's very hot as well. And the reason this was one of the first ones discovered is you have this very large planet, so it can tug on its star very strongly. And it's also really close to its star, so that gravitational strength is even greater. So these very massive, very close in planets are the easiest ones to detect. So these are the first ones that we actually saw. So that was 1995, 1996, I was born. And ever since uh, we've been discovering, oops, can I play this? Oh, it's not playing. Oh, there we go. Okay. So all of these dots, these green ones were discovered by the Doppler method. And then in 2009, the Kepler Space Telescope was launched. Uh, and so all these red points are discovered by transits. There's also some of these distant planets way out here that are quite massive, uh, discovered by direct imaging that's actually seeing light from the planet and taking a picture of it. Um, but just looking at this graph, we've got 3,000 planets here. I think we've got about another 1,000 more since uh, 2017. So 4,000 planets, and you can immediately start to see some of these interesting clusters of where planets sort of exist. So this one circled here is the hot Jupiters. These are Jupiter-sized planets very close to their stars, so very hot. Also cold Jupiters, uh, kind of like our own Jupiter, um, but not as many sort of in between, which is interesting. Maybe this explains a little bit about where these giant planets form and whether or not they then have their orbits migrate towards uh, super close in orbits if they formed much further away. You might also notice there's a gap of uh, seemingly missing planets here. You might think, well, maybe we just haven't detected these, but all of these planets that are smaller and also smaller and further away would have weaker signals and yet we detect hundreds or thousands of them. So it's not that we can't detect them, it's actually that there's no planets there, which is very interesting that uh, these sort of intermediate 10 to 100 Earth mass planets don't exist very close to their stars. And we think that's because planets in this mass range likely have a large atmosphere that is basically uh, very easily blasted away by the heat and light from the, star, from the star. And so what actually happens is that atmosphere is blasted away and it basically falls down in this plot to one of these lower mass things, that lower mass just being whatever rocky core was in that planet. So we call this the hot Neptune desert. And the area of this graph that I'm most interested in is circled here. Uh, there are very few planets here because this is actually where we're not quite sensitive to measuring these kinds of planets, but we're getting close. Uh, and this is where something like Earth 2.0 might be. This is, these are planets that are likely rocky, likely similar in size to the Earth, um, but aren't too hot that an atmosphere and or water on the surface would be boiled away and not too cold that that water would be frozen somewhere in the middle where the water could exist in a liquid form. So for the rest of this talk, I want to sort of dive into just how hard it is to detect these small planets. So to represent the scale of the problem here, let's make the sun an eight pound bowling ball. So regulation size, that's eight and a half inches across. Then proportionally, the earth would be a two millimeter grain of sand, just 10 milligrams in weight. That's sitting at the 50 yard line if the bowling ball was on the goal line. And so what we're trying to measure is the gravitational tug on the bowling ball by the tiny grain of sand that's on the 50 yard line. And we're making this measurement from the other side of the country. So as you can imagine, this is quite difficult. So here's an example of what this, a spectrum from a star might actually look like. So we've taken that uh, just light from the star and split it up into its colors from red at the top left to blue on the bottom right. And you can see it's absolutely littered with all of these dark absorption bands from different elements and molecules in the atmosphere of a star. Now, if we zoom in on this, we can watch the effect of the Doppler shift move these lines back and forth across our camera pixels, which we'll measure as having different amounts of light in each pixel as that dark band moves back and forth. So 
the scale that's sort of demonstrated here where this line is moving back and forth one pixel on our camera, that's the velocity of the star of about 500 meters per second or about a thousand miles an hour. So to put that into uh, a planet around a star, that's a two, a planet twice as massive as Jupiter orbiting its star once per day. So this is a, a very extreme case. Uh, and for Earth around the sun, that grain of sand around the bowling ball, this shift is only nine centimeters per second. So that's 0.2 miles an hour, uh, about 5,000 times smaller than what's shown here, and about 10,000 times smaller than a camera pixel. If you actually zoomed in on a pixel with an electron microscope, you could see all of the silicon atoms that make up a camera pixel. These absorption lines are moving back and forth just five atoms wide. So to even have a hope of measuring this, there's a lot of things we have to consider, both on the instrument and both on the star. So the first thing on the instrument is we need a really stable reference that we can sort of measure this, these shifting lines with respect to. So just taking a step back, what's happening? We have our star, we're observing it with a, a telescope that's collecting all the light from it. And then we send all that light into a spectrograph. That spectrograph splits the light up into all of the colors and we take a picture of it. And we get that rainbow looking spectrum with a bunch of dark lines on top of it corresponding to all those absorption lines that we had saw before. So one way, uh, one, one kind of ruler that we can have um, is to put a cell of heated iodine gas in front of uh, the prism. And what that does is the, the light passing through this iodine cell will get absorbed based on the different wavelengths, the different colors that iodine gas absorbs light at. And so we kind of have these two, uh, these two sets of lines superimposed on the spectrum. And uh, the, the, we know from uh, very precise laboratory controlled measurements of iodine where all of those lines are from the iodine gas. And so when the star lines move, you just measure how much they move with respect to the iodine lines. And say if there's any errors uh, in your spectrograph where say two mirrors, the distance between them changes, it will affect both the star lines and the iodine lines the same. And so that, that error should basically cancel itself out. So as long as you're looking at the relative change, you're measuring what should just be motion from the star. Now, one way that the distance between two mirrors might change in your spectrograph is if the temperature changes. Uh, we, uh, might know that if things get warmer, materials will expand. And if things get colder, materials will shrink. And if the distance between two mirrors grows or shrinks by just one nanometer, that can create a shift of the lines on our camera that looks like a Doppler shift of about one meter per second, which is about the signal that we're, we're looking for for these, these planets. So they need, we need to keep these things very temperature stable. Um, but all in all, this iodine method works fantastically. And you can reach precisions of about one to two meters per second. Uh, so like walking speed. An alternative is to just make the spectrograph super duper stable. So what's shown here is a computer animation of the Keck Planet Finder, which is being developed and built right now um, at UC Berkeley, uh, being led by my advisor at Caltech. And Zerodur, or sorry, and KPF, the Keck Planet Finder, is you. Uh, unique in that it's being made out of this material called zero dir. This is everything you see in uh, this animation that's sort of this tan color is this zero dir glass. This is a special mixture of glass and ceramic that effectively cancels out the effect of thermal expansion, which means that this entire setup has an extremely small response to temperature changes, about 2,000 times better than stainless steel. If you were to change the temperature by just one degree, oops, then the distances, uh, like the material would grow uh, or shrink by just 0.7 micro percent. Uh, and on top of that, the whole thing is put in a vacuum chamber with a 0 0.01 degree temperature stability. So you can, you can basically just trust that this whole thing is very stable. All the mirrors and lenses and everything, the light is bouncing around between is extremely close to constant. And any shift that you see in the two cameras here 
are caused by motions from the star and not motions from your instrument. And KPF will rely on this intrinsic stability to reach precisions of just 30 centimeters per second or about two thirds of a mile an hour. So just for comparison to sort of an, an everyday scale, the speedometer in your car is accurate to about 5% error. So for example, if you're going 60 miles an hour, that reading is good to about three miles an hour. Uh, that's about five times worse than KPF <laughs> can measure the relative speed of another star. Uh, of course, speedometers are purposefully calibrated high so that this error will never give you a reading lower than you're actually going. So you also can't blame your speedometer for why you, the speedometer error for why you're speeding. And if you're also considering this, the relative precision compared to how fast that star is actually flying through space, which is something like 200,000 miles an hour, this is, this is a relative precision on this, the same scale as measuring the distance from New York to LA to about 50 feet. So despite having all these super stable instruments and fancy ways of keeping things uh, to a, 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 a well-measured reference, Everything in the universe is moving, and we have to account for this if we want to just isolate the relative motion of a star due to its orbiting planet. So the first thing to deal with is the fact that we're making this measurement on a moving platform. So we're rotating 400 meters a second, about 1,000 miles an hour. We're also revolving around the sun, about 60,000 miles an hour. And the whole Earth and sun system is flying through the galaxy at something like uh, 200 kilometers a second or 500,000 miles an hour. So luckily for us, we have a, a long history of observations from NASA satellites uh, and um, just all sorts of space satellites observing the Earth and the solar system. Um, Newton and Einstein figured out gravity. So we have a really good understanding of where things in the solar system are, uh, how fast they're going. And these decades long uh, of data from these satellites allows us to basically know exactly where the Earth is and where it's moving uh, at each time that we wanna actually observe another star. So these can all sort of be calculated and accounted for to a, within a few centimeters per second. So the star, like I said, is also moving uh, in some random direction through the galaxy with some speed, but we really only care about the relative change in speed due to an orbiting planet. So as long as we can measure relative speeds precisely, we're set, but we do still need to know where the star is in the sky. So what are its coordinates and how fast does it appear to move across the sky so that when we're taking an observation, we can make sure we're looking straight at it. We're also, as I'm sure many of us are uh, intimately familiar, uh, are looking through a very dirty lens. This is true for any ground-based observatory. We have to look through the atmosphere. This is, the atmosphere is bubbly, it's turbulent, there's winds and shears, and uh, this not only blurs the image of the star, but also can absorb some of the star's light, depending on the elements and molecules in the Earth's atmosphere. And this can create additional absorption lines, which can make it harder to measure where the lines are from the star. And so those can contaminate our data and cause errors on that like 10 centimeters per second level. So this is also something we need to study and understand and be able to correct for. And on top of that, sometimes the atmosphere makes these things called clouds, and that just completely blocks our way of seeing stars at all. So that's, that's never appreciated. Uh, so even if we had a perfectly clear, uh, just excellent conditions, great night, no clouds, and we had a, a perfect instrument with excellent precision, the fundamental limit to being able to detect Earth 2.0 might actually be the stars themselves. And there's a few reasons for this. One is the surfaces of stars are quite bubbly. This is a zoomed in extremely high resolution video of the sun. And all of these, uh, you can see that sort of how time is moving forward at about a minute per second on the bottom right. This is, you can see these huge blobs of gases and plasma rising up to the surface of the sun and sinking back down via convection, just like water boiling on your stovetop. This makes the, 
the bulk surface of the star at times appear to move towards us and away from us as those cells rise up and down. Uh, this is about a few meters per second, and it happens on time scales from a few minutes to hours. And as you might imagine, those motions towards us and away from us can mimic a redshift and blue shift like a planet. And this can actually bury the signal of a small planet. Uh, if we're looking for Earth around the sun, remember that's nine centimeters per second. And this effect from convection, uh, AKA granulation, can be three meters per second. But because this only happens over minutes to hours, we can try to uh, sort of account for this by taking multiple measurements of a star throughout the night. And then in a sense, we can average this effect out, but it, it won't be a perfect cancellation. Here's a, a zoom out just to give a sense of the scale of those convection cells. Uh, that box uh, is what the movie was looking at compared to the whole surface of the sun. Each of these cells is like the size of Texas. So, you know, not that, not that big. Stars will also pulsate radially. You can kind of think of this as the star breathing in and out due to pressure waves inside them building up and causing the star to puff out. I'm not gonna get too much into the physics of this. Um, if you're interested more, happy to talk about it more in the Q and A. Or better yet, uh, as part of the Caltech Astro Outreach series, uh, one of our professors, Jim Fuller, gave a whole um, public talk about uh, called the sounds of stars, which goes into these pulsation modes. Anyway, the effect is as these stars are pulsating outwards, it's growing in size, and the face of the star we're looking at appears to move towards us. And as you might guess, as it contracts, it looks like it's moving away from us. So this is creating a redshift and blue shift that would make the same sort of signal as a planet. These oscillations are uh, on timescales of a few to tens of minutes. The sun does this once every five minutes. Um, and it's a few to 10 centimeters per second, even up to a few meters per second in speed. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, we can try to average this out. Um, in some cases, we can take longer exposures, so maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, to sort of average over this pulsation or even multiple quick exposures in a row and trying to average those together. But again, this isn't a perfect solution. Here's just a comparison again of the size of the signal compared to that nine centimeters per second of the earth around the sun. So one of the most annoying things about stars uh, in this business is that stars also have spots and this is one of the hardest sources of contamination to deal with. So the problem comes from the fact that as the star is rotating, one side of the star will appear blue shifted, the side that's rotating towards us, and the other half of the star appears red shifted, the half of the star rotating away from us. And star spots, just like sunspots on the sun, are these little blobs of reduced brightness. So if you're looking at that part of the sun, there's just less light coming from it. So if a spot, is on the red shifted side, the part rotating away from us, it will look like there's less red shifted light overall compared to the blue shifted light, and you'll measure an anomalous blue shift, um, and vice versa <coughs> um, on the other side. So basically, as those spots are rotating, they're moving from the blue shifted side to the red shifted side, and that causes this anomaly of uh, a, a something that looks like a Doppler shift from a planet that happens at the same time scale of the star's rotation period, which we can't always measure. In some cases we can, and that helps us figure out whether or not a signal is a planet or if it's um, just the star with spots rotating in and out of view. Um, so another complication is these spots can grow and shrink in time. They can also uh, move uh, and decay. So the, this effect will vary each time the spot comes around uh, as the star rotates. Um, so a, a, a tricky source of noise to deal with. And it can be quite significant, up to 10 meters per second. Another thing that changes spots uh, and can create an additional fake planetary signal are these activity cycles that last about decades. So this is um, 
data on the sun going back to the 1870s even. On the top, these are the latitudes of, of sunspots over time. You can see sunspots at some parts of the cycle are closer to plus or minus 30 degrees latitude and sort of move towards the solar equator on these 11 year cycles. And on the bottom, this is just counting up all of the sunspots as a percentage of the area on the sun that we can see. And you can see at sometimes there are more spots and at sometimes there are no spots on these 11 year cycles. And even looking at longer term cycles, the peaks sort of go from these lower uh, number of sunspots up to here in 1960, this was an activity cycle with uh, many more spots than normal. Um, and then it goes back down again. And so what this means is that strength of that uh, star spot fake Doppler signal that I just described, the strength of that changes over time on a decades long time scale. And so this might make a signal that looks like something like Jupiter, something that's very far away from its star and sort of takes 10 plus years to orbit. But in reality, it's just the activity cycle of the star changing on, a, on that time scale. Um, one last sort of weird uh, effect that might happen is a flare or coronal mass ejection from a star. This is just a little burst of material towards us, which would be a little spike in blue shift if you happen to observe at the same time as this. Um, but since these aren't happening at regular intervals, you can usually distinguish these. Um, and it's pretty rare that you would actually measure at the, the same time as this. Although, if we're talking about looking for a habitable planet, one with just the right temperature for water to be liquid on its surface, we, wouldn't, we, we would ideally want to look for planets around the smallest stars. And that's because that region where liquid water, where the planet is in that sort of Goldilocks zone of the right temperature, if a star is smaller and cooler, you can bring the planet closer to it and still have that, uh, that right balance of temperature. That means if the planet is closer to its star, that it will create a larger signal, which is more easy to detect. So these, these smallest stars called red dwarfs or M dwarfs are actually the most common star in the universe. And so we think probably are the, the best bet for having the most planets in this habitable zone. Although these small stars are also the most active, they have the strongest and most frequent flares of any other class of star. So keeping that in mind, I would ask what habitable means in the context of such an environment. If you're a planet orbiting an M dwarf, you at, mo you at least want to have a, a very good magnetic field to shield you. OK, so just to conclude a little bit, how do we actually deal with this effect of stellar activity, all these different sources from the star that plague our, our measurement of the star speed? One is to just ignore it <laughs> um, and risk false positive detections where you say, oh, I found a planet at uh, orbiting its star once every 20 days, but turns out that's just how long it takes the star to rotate, and there were just spots. Uh, a little bit better would be to avoid it. So this means choosing stars to observe, which have are, are sort of quote unquote quiet. They, I, they, we either know or expect these effects to be minimal on such a star. Better yet, we can minimize it by adopting some smart observing strategies like the averaging over those oscillations or convection like what I was talking about before. But all of these still leave contamination that buries the signal of an Earth-like planet around a Sun-like star. So if we really want to deal with this, we need to understand it, develop accurate physical models, and then subtract that effect from the data. Um, and a whole other talk, in fact, entire conferences are dedicated to the many efforts underway to solve this problem. Because if we can't figure out how to correct for this, then it won't really matter how precise of an instrument we build. These small planets will just go undetected and buried under the noise of the stars which they orbit. This is being called the challenge of the decade in the, the field of uh, the Doppler method or sometimes called the radial velocity method in exoplanets. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Excellent, excellent. Um, so I'll, first I'll jump in um, and I'll mention that uh, you had mentioned Dr. Fuller giving um, talks on star pulsations. We actually had him here in June. So, uh, and, awesome. uh, 
So that was, yeah, that was a great talk on his part. And I'll launch this off with a question. Um, you mentioned doing calibration with iodine lines. Um, and I wanted to ask, did you, do you use multiple lines to do your calibrations or just single lines? Yes, uh, in fact, thousands. <laughs> so iodine is, is one of the uh, like ideal use, like sort of ways to do this. One, I guess, because it's for cost and ease of access and use, but also it contains just thousands of these absorption lines that if we're looking for motion on just one line, right, for one meter per second, that's about a thousandth the size of a pixel. So it's going to be extremely difficult to actually see unless we can sort of average the motions of many thousands of lines. So there's a, a chunk of the visible the visible light part of the spectrum where the uh, those iodine lines absorb the most. And that's the part of the spectrum. We use the whole thing to uh, average up all those motions. OK. Questions for Ryan? Can you tell us more about the iodine lamp? Is the iodine heated? Does it emit lines, or is this absorption? Yeah, it's all, so it's just absorption um, and it is heated to, so the, the instrument that still uses this that um, I've observed quite a bit with is called PiRes, the high resolution shell spectrometer at Keck Observatory in Hawaii. Um, and I, the temperature is like something like 65 degrees Celsius. I, I have this number memorized for each time we go observing we have to make sure it's at that temperature all night and not deviating too much because that will change the amount of absorption that you get. And then the code that actually computes how these motions are happening relative to the iodine is made such that it's looking at an iodine spectrum in the conditions that we're supposed to be observing it at. So you have to keep not just the instrument temperature stable, but also the iodine cell temperature stable. Okay. Next question for Ryan. Steve, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, yes, hi, Ryan. Thanks very much. Speaking of Doppler effect and a car that's moving, the, the speed of sound and the speed of car are like one order of magnitude separate. But the speed of, the speed of light and wobbling of a star, which is like, in the case of Earth and Sun, is like once a year. And I don't know how many feet it is. I mean, you're trying to modulate two extremely different velocities. And I'm just can't, I can't imagine how you do it. Yeah, that's, that's one of the remarkable things about this technique. Yeah, the speed of light is super fast. It's 300 million meters per second. And we're looking for a star moving, say maybe three meters per second. So that's one part in 10 to the eight. <laughs> um, and that's why these motions that you get are fractions of a pixel in size. They're, they're ridiculously small. So yeah, we need very precise instruments. Um, it's not quite to the, the scale of say the LIGO uh, interferometer, which detects gravitational waves by seeing distances change by a thousandth of a proton diameter. Um, that's a little more extreme, but it's, yeah, it, that stuff blows my mind too. It's kind of remarkable that it works at all. I had a question related to that. Um, you, well, first to comment, and it was just interesting because a, a friend of mine who's a kind of conspiracy, conspiracy theorist thinks that um, global warming is from the earth getting closer and closer to the sun. So it was good to hear how precisely we have that measured and that, you know, that's, that's not uh, in the realm of possibility. But um, you, you've mentioned several times, you know, fraction of a, a fraction of a pixel uh, measurements, et cetera. Could these, are these um, instruments going to get more precise as um, uh, digital sensors uh, advance and pixels get smaller and smaller and we have better manufacturing technology to create smaller pixels to, to detect smaller movements? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the thing 
that sort of limits your ability to see a, a line move back and forth. So these, these lines, we like to think of lines as these perfectly thin, uh, like one dimensional thing. But in reality, there's all these different processes, one in the stars, also in the atmosphere, and also just imperfections in the instrument that spread that line out over maybe a pixel or two on the detector. And so instead of a line, you actually sort of have this uh, like bell curve shaped thing. Um, and so seeing that move back and forth is more difficult the wider that line gets. So there's a limit to sort of how wide that line can get just from physics and also the uncertainty principle. But in short, basically, at a certain point, you can make your pixel smaller and smaller, but eventually you won't be gaining any extra resolution because you'll then be limited by sort of how wide these actual absorption lines from the star are. Um, so it's, I think it's actually pretty close to the same scale, like as about one pixel. Um, so I think there could be a little bit of a gain in terms of resolution in the actual camera sensors. Um, you could also try building higher resolution spectrographs so that you can more finely uh, sort of see the lines move back and forth. But again, you're still sort of limited by how big these lines actually are uh, from the stars. Next question. Um, I have Hi. A okay. Oh, sorry, um, go ahead. Yeah. Brian, um, at one point, uh, talking about the detector, you, you showed a uh, photograph of the silicon atoms uh, in the detector. Um, what was the point of showing that, and, and how did you take that picture? Uh, so I, I think I, I stole that slide from another person in, in a, my group. I believe it's uh, from an electron microscope that basically looking at the, the shadows of electrons going through uh, something. So it's, it's much smaller than the wavelengths of light. So we can't actually take a real picture of it. Um, electrons are like technically zero size. So I guess that kind of works. I don't really understand how, how to just, make an electron microscope. It's an atomic force microscope. Yeah. So the, the point was within a single pixel, the amount that those lines are moving back and forth due to the star appearing to move towards us and away from us because the planet is tugging it around in its own orbit, the line moves just five atoms across. So it's like 10,000 times smaller than the pixel itself. And if you actually zoomed in onto the, atom, the atoms that make up that pixel, it's only moving back and forth five atoms wide. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next question. So we're not we're not quite there yet. <laughs> uh, another question, Steve. Uh, Ryan, how many stars do you capture in every scan? Are you focusing on just one at a time, or you catch capture a thousand and then you 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 sift through the data? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I guess I could answer that in two different ways. Each night we try to get as many stars as possible. So time on like the Keck Observatory is very valuable. So we want to use up as much of the night as possible and get as many different stars as we can. So each star we're observing for anywhere from a couple seconds exposure time to 45 minutes is about as long as we go. And that means we can get usually on a good night, like 50 to 100 stars per night. Then, uh, our group in, in total has observed about nine, a little over 9,000 stars. And so each time you observe the star, you get one data point for how fast the star was moving relative to you at that time. And if you want to measure a planet, you need to do that measurement a bunch of times. And each time you get a new point on your, your graph, each your say, one day it was moving towards us at one meter per second, and then it was two, and then it was one, then it was zero, and then it was minus one. And you sort of trace this uh, sine curve looking thing, which is showing the planet pulling on the star and making it move back and forth in that oscillating motion. So 
for 9,000 stars, probably an average of order like 50 observations per star. Some stars we've observed like 400 times, some stars we've observed maybe a few times, and then it turned out there's actually this huge velocity that's probably from a second star that we just can't see. And so we give up on it because we're looking for planets and not binary stars. <laughs> um, so yeah, some like tens of thousands of observations since the 90s um, using the high-res spectrograph at Keck Observatory. And KPF, the nice thing about KPF is it'll be much more efficient. And so it'll be about eight times faster at doing this than high res. So that means we can do eight times as many stars at the same brightness in the same time, or we can look at fainter stars, uh, which is really exciting. Next question. Hi, I uh, have a question. Sure. Yeah. So, um... Uh, for this, um, uh, so these techniques will be uh, optimal for edge on uh, uh, star systems, correct? Not a face face on. Yes. So exactly. uh, basically, there is it's basically there is no uh, is any techniques actually to available for face on star systems available. And also, like uh, a second question, follow up questions. So what is the advantage of that uh, for your, your experiment compared to surveyors like Kibler's and some uh, like the current surveyors? Okay, why, why you see actually this experiment actually has advantage over the optical uh, techniques? Yeah, great question. So you're exactly right. You're, you're most sensitive to an edge on planet uh, and transits are only uh, sensitive to edge on planets. So as you sort of tilt more towards a face on orbit, you get less of that star's motion towards and away from you. So for a big enough planet that can still be enough to detect, but you won't know what the actual mass of the planet is. You'll only know sort of what that projected uh, on the plane of the sky motion is, which basically gives you a lower bound for the mass. So for planets where we don't know that, that tilt, we can only say the planet is at least this massive. The best thing is if we also see it transiting. So not only then can we get a mass and a radius, but we know that that mass is the true mass and not the minimum mass because that edge on orientation means what we're seeing is the true motion. So right, transits only give size and the orbital period. Um, this technique gives you the mass also gives you the orbital period. If you already know the planet to be transiting, that can help because then you can sort of time your observations at the best moments to sort of see that orbit sort of get mapped out in your data. Um, you can also measure things like how circular or eccentric the orbit is um, with this technique. It sort of changes the, the shape from more of a sine curve if it was uh, a perfect, perfectly circular orbit to something more spiky. Uh, you could think of, if you have this really stretched out orbit where the planet is moving very slowly during the, the time where it's very far away, and then it sort of whiplashes around the star, you'll get this huge spike in the star's velocity during that short moment where the planet whips around the star, and then it sort of drags out for a long time. So you can also measure that. And then for the face on orbits, there's this other technique which is sort of being, uh, developed more now and in the next few years called astrometry. And this is measuring the positions of stars on the sky to extreme precisions, like uh, micro arc seconds <laughs> on the sky. So in this case, you can actually watch the star move in its orbit um, due to another planet. Instead of measuring its, its velocity through something like the Doppler effect, you're actually seeing the star move on the plane of the sky. So you have to, of course, zoom in a lot um, and have really precise measurements of the star's coordinates in the sky. So the Gaia spacecraft is one doing this yes. for like a billion stars in the Milky Way. It's getting those positions extremely precisely. And it's doing this over about a decade um, in time. And so in like five years or so, they'll release all of that data, which will be positions of stars over time, over like uh, five, 10 years. And 
you may be able to see like, for example, some massive planets that are pulling on their stars. Um, and that'll sort of open us up into actually one, seeing systems that are uh, like face on instead of edge on, but also you can then measure that inclination, that tilt for these other systems. And instead of just having a lower bound on the mass, you can actually calculate the mass. So this will be huge in sort of unlocking all of these planets discovered with just the Doppler effect um, into actually determining what their, what their true mass is. All right, next question. You'll every once in a while hear about, you know, the most Earth-like planet we've discovered so far, or the most Goldilocks planet we've discovered so far. Do you know, this is kind of putting you in the hot seat, but like recently, you know, what, what uh, sort of planets uh, fit into that uh, category? I mean, have we seen anything remotely Earth-like? And was it discovered through, through the Doppler effect or something, or uh, the, the transit method? Yeah, so definitely the most planets have come out of the transit technique, just because like for Kepler, you just, it just stared at a spot of like 100,000 stars for four years. And then it saw these dips and you get uh, about 1% of systems are oriented so that you get that. So for 100,000 stars, there's about 1,000 systems. Some of these had multiple planets. So you've got like the three or 4,000 planets that we've discovered. I think only a handful are sort of in that, that right zone. There's this number that the field really wants to measure, which is called eta Earth. And this is the frequency of Earth-like planets in the habitable zone of their stars. And there's a lot of debate about what those terms mean. <laughs> so first, what is Earth-like? So you have to define that in terms of how big a planet is relative to the Earth, if it's rocky, um, if it has an atmosphere, which we're getting, we'll be able to measure uh, in some cases with the James Webb Space Telescope when that launches. So we don't really know even for these like Earth-sized planets, if it has an atmosphere and if it has the right sort of composition atmosphere that we would deem breathable. <laughs> um, of course, we're always referring to this in terms of Earth life standards and not how some other completely alien species might evolve to the conditions that it finds itself in. Um, so I would say as a field, we haven't quite even agreed on what Earth-like means. <laughs> um, but we're like with these new, uh, with these new instruments, these new space telescopes, uh, we'll, we'll at least start to be able to measure these, all the different things that we seem to like say that we require for habitability. Um, in some cases for the first time, in other cases, uh, just measuring things more precisely. So I can't, I don't, I don't know too many exoplanet names off the top of my head, um, but I know like each time one comes out, that's like a little bit closer. It's the newest Earth-like planet. And that sort of just keeps one upping itself uh, each time we find more planets. But as far as Earth, like close to Earth mass at around a one year orbital period around sun-like stars, there's only like two. And these are both from transits because the, the Doppler method is just not sensitive enough quite yet to being able to see those. Next question. Uh, hi. Uh, Ask me again in 10 years. <laughs> sure. uh, I have a qu another question. Uh, uh, so Ryan, uh, is the data available for public use or like uh, can we download it and see it and play with it or like uh, is only Celtic students can, or like until staff who uh, have access to this data. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess I would say it depends on the data. <laughs> um, I'll post this link in the chat. There's, there's this, uh, NASA runs the Exoplanet Archive, um, which is actually hosted at Caltech, at IPAC. This has all of the data for like the properties of the planets that we've discovered and confirmed. So masses, sizes, um, orbital distances, the kinds of stars they orbit, all of that information is in there. Um, there's some, there's like some plotting tools so you can sort of explore that data set. There's, I believe, or maybe this is under construction, 
There are also some uh, like, like citizen science projects associated with this where you can browse through transit data. So these are the brightness of the star versus time. And you can look through it by eye to see if you can find dips. And this helps the computer algorithms then know sort of what to look for when it's looking through, like for Kepler, this was 100,000 stars. Um, the TESS satellite, which is up right now, is looking at the entire sky, not just this little patch that Kepler stared at. So it's going to be uh, not hundreds of thousands of stars, but millions of stars. And that can be a lot um, to, to sift through. And so getting real human eyes on some of this data can be a huge help. Um, I can definitely try to dig this up, the link for this, uh, and send it around, but I don't have it right now. Sure, you can uh, just email it to me and I'll um, pass it out. Um, I, I, I'd like to jump in with a question. Um, many of our, our members have heard of, you know, the odd uh, star in the transit world, which was the tabby star. Do you have a tabby star that's, you know, like Ryan's star or something weird is going on that you don't know what it is? Yeah, um, I love that question. I actually, allow me to share my screen and pull this up. Ooh, live data um, from Cap. This, this is, and it was actually just submitted uh, last week. This was my, my first paper that I submitted. <gasps> We promise not to leak it to the world. <laughs> um, I have a little movie for this. Okay, so this is this planet called WASP 107, uh, <clears throat> 107b. And this is what we think it looks like as it, so we, we saw this thing transit and basically the same way that those star spots, they can block out red shifted light and blue shifted light and make a, sort of radial velocity signal. Actually, I actually have an animation for this too. Um, a planet as it transits will do the exact same thing. And if it's transiting uh, sort of with the rotation of the star, it will make one shape. And if it's transiting at a different angle, it will make a different shape. And so this lets you work out sort of how the orbit of the planet is inclined relative to the star. So for the solar system, everything orbits basically in a flat pancake around the star's equator, around the sun's equator. Um, from the data for this one, it looks like it's going around the poles. <laughs> uh, so this is kind of what it might look like. We're kind of looking at the, the star on its pole instead of on its side. And then this thing is also going backwards. <laughs> it's going from the red shifted side to the blue shifted side. So call that a retrograde orbit, also sort of close to polar. Um, and we're starting to see, this is like the, the fourth system where we see this orbit sort of in this polar slash retrograde configuration. And it also has this distant giant planet companion sort of in its outer extrasolar system. So there might be some sort of weird gravitational planet to planet interaction going on that we we have some ideas for, but we don't have enough of these systems discovered yet to sort of be able to say definitively one way or another. Um, one of the ideas is that this orbit processes in time. And so you won't always see the thing transit. Sometimes that orbit lines up with the star and you would see it go in front. Other times it sort of looks to be face on it's also like jiggling all over the place um, because it's not a perfectly circular orbit and it's general relativity makes it do this weird uh, precession thing. You might've heard about uh, Mercury. this in the case of Mercury. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of doing this weird, <laughs> this weird dance. Um, but this would mean at some points in time you would see it transit around the poles and other times it would appear to be lined up and it's just sort of, when you happen to look at the system. So I would like more data, of course, <laughs> um, but to sort of find more of these things and see if they sort of follow the trend of, are we just catching these things at random? And some of them are tilted weirdly and some of them are sort of aligned or 
is there some other sort of physics or orbital dynamics that causes orbits to end up in these these polar orbits retrograde pole yeah retrograde there are some like hot jupiters so giant jupiter mass planets in like three day orbits that are completely backwards <laughs> Um, and that those are probably some very like violent dynamics and scattering with other giant planets that probably got mm -hmm. kicked out of the system and that caused one of them to end up just completely backwards to, <laughs> to how it should be going. That's cool. Next question for Ryan. Well, I have a really obscure question then if we <laughs> So you mentioned you have a thermally stabilized zero dir optical bench, um, mm -hmm. which you chose for uh, coefficient of thermal expansion being very small. Uh, do you actually look even at the homogeneity of the coefficient of thermal expansion when you pick your design and your material? Um, by that, just being like, Across Very the easy. entire instrument being, yeah. Yeah. The, the yeah. CT is so, one thing at one point and a slightly different value at another point. Yeah. But you're so looking I at guess, really small errors. Yeah. Um, and they're most important on the things that the light is bouncing off of. So there, there are some parts of the instrument that don't have to be held to the same standard. Um, one tricky thing is that the mirrors themselves won't be made out of zero dir. And so those oh. can change size. And the you, you want them to be held in place also mm -hmm. by like zero dir. So there, there is this whole engineering challenge of getting like zero dir to zero dir interfaces to sort of we, hold yeah. all of the, the optics <laughs> in place. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually a cool story that, yeah. <laughs> the, um, the, the glass for this came from, uh, like a blank that was going to be polished into a telescope mirror mm -hmm. for some space satellite that then uh, never ended up going up. And so it got reused for this. Right. But for example, the, the Keck telescope has its mirrors, its primary mirror made out of zero dir. <clears throat> Other questions? Okay, I have more questions then. Um, <laughs> You said you primarily work at Keck. Do you work at other observatories also? Um, I don't as much. Um, many of my collaborators do. So okay. right right now is like submit your proposals for the James Webb Space Telescope. <laughs> um, so hopefully that will be available uh, in about a year. I think it's it's supposed to be launching on Halloween next year. <laughs> it's always a year off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but for, for sighting planet atmospheres, people will use the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. Um, Caltech also, of course, has Palomar Observatory, which, right. uh, you know, the, the telescope is the same from 80 years ago, but the instruments keep, just keep being updated and it's, it's still as productive as ever. We have members of our organization, they're docents at uh, the Palomar Observatory, so. I have a question again, Steve. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, Ryan, how many um, teams like yours are doing this? Is this unique in the United States or are Europeans and Japanese also chasing the same thing? Yeah, um, I think everyone is. Uh, like right now, the or, so we've gone from, I guess, like what people would call precision radial velocity to now extreme precision radial velocity. And this is getting these velocities to like 10 centimeters per second. So you can see earth analogs around sun-like stars. So there's a, a whole bunch of instruments like this coming up in the next generation. One that's online uh, and has gotten first light already is called Express or Espresso. Uh, and that is, they're actually able to, they're getting like, tens of centimeters per second um, measurements, which is really exciting. I think they're, they're based at the Very Large Telescope in Chile. So I don't know if they do this very often, but they're able to use all four of the eight meter telescopes there and combine the light from all of them 
which basically simulates a 16 meter <laughs> telescope. Um, They're doing that for, for signal to noise? Yeah, so I guess that's one issue that this field has is uh, because we're taking the light from a star and spreading it up into a spectrum, and then we would need a very high resolution to be able to see all of these lines. You get, mm -hmm. you take a lot of light and then you end up with a very small amount of light in each pixel. So this really only works best around very bright stars. So having big telescopes like Keck or VLT really help. Um, but there's also plans uh, at some uh, smaller observatories like the WIND telescope in Arizona, I think it's three meters. There's a new instrument being built by NASA to go there called NUID, N-E-I-D. Um, and that will be like a, another like meter per second level um, instrument. Cool. Next question. Have we run out of questions for Ryan? I think we have. Okay, well, Ryan, thank you very much for your time. It was a very yeah, good pleasure. Thanks for all the great questions. Yeah, all right. Well, well, round of applause for our members, please. Okay. And with that, I call the end of our November meeting of the San Diego Astronomy Association. See you all next month.